Hi everyone, it's uh, Matt Wendell, uh, research scientist at the River Institute in Cornwall. And uh, for this next uh, pre presenter, I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Stephen Cook. Uh, I've known Steve for a number of years, and I'm very, very happy that he's able to join us today to share some of his recent and very timely research. Uh, Steve, Dr. Cook, is a professor of environmental and Dis interdisciplinary sciences at Carleton University. And his work spans natural and social sciences, and he, he brings it all together in a very uh, unique way um, and focuses on developing solutions to a lot of issues facing uh, freshwater ecosystems across the world, actually, uh, not just in Canada. And Steve works with uh, many, many uh, government regulators, practitioners, policymakers. Uh, he also founded the Canadian Centre for Evidence-Based Conservation. And he works with a number of partners through that uh, center as well to synthesize research um, to help improve freshwater ecosystems across the world. Uh, Steve is a prolific uh, publisher. He has over 700 peer reviewed papers, which is amazing. And he runs a very large lab at Carleton University with um, many graduate students as well and has a uh, great influence on a number of uh, a lot of careers as well. So uh, today, Steve is going to be sharing some of the results of his recent research on how the COVID-19 pandemic has influenced freshwater fish biodiversity in fisheries. So I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing about that, Steve, and um, welcome to uh, today's symposium. Great. Good morning, everybody. I hope everybody is doing well wherever you are situated. Today, I join you from the traditional and unceded territory of the Algonquin peoples. I'm in Greeley, Ontario, just south of Ottawa. And today I'm gonna to be talking about COVID and its impact on freshwater fish biodiversity and management. Admittedly, back in early March, this is something that uh, I, I could have never imagined that uh, we would be where we are today, but also that we would be as a lab engaged in scholarship in this activity. So uh, it's really been uh, quite a, a fascinating journey and uh, I will share with you some of those perspectives today. Before we get going, I want to acknowledge several things. First of all, this is a, a horrible uh, pandemic. Many people have died. Unfortunately, many more people will die. People are suffering in various ways. The other thing is that even if one has their health, they may be impacted in other ways, such as their livelihoods. They may be unable to secure the food they need. Culture, uh, cultural practices have been disrupted. Education, social practice, and mental health, well-being, and so on. So when I talk about fish today, I do so uh, in an attempt not to draw attention away from those other issues, but rather instead to try and link them all together. And the way that I do that is in thinking about um, uh, fish and, and humans and ecosystems uh, as being interconnected. So lately, people have been pushing this idea of one health, where animal health, human health, and environmental health are intimately linked. Beyond that, some of the work that we've done in our lab reflecting on the sustainable development goals, which tackle really pressing issues like zero hunger, clean water and sanitation, no poverty and so on. Um, if you if you look at the base of that tree uh, and we we created this this diagram using the uh, the SDGs, you can see that the two environmental one um, SDGs, life below water and life on land, really underpin or the anchor for everything else that we do in terms of what we're trying to achieve with the, the sustainable development goal. So for me, environment and people are inherently linked. So in, in working on fish and talking about fish today, I do believe that we are also benefiting people. So there's no doubt that COVID-19 has changed human behavior. That's evident from the fact that many of you are, are at home in your underwear taking in this presentation. Uh, but uh, if, we, if we go back to the, the very early days, it was in early April, uh, April 5th, when uh, on a global basis, there were over 4 billion people that were uh, under confinement in quotes. Um, and uh, I, I use those, the air quotes to recognize that in some countries uh, that was mandated from the top and enforced by the military. And in other places, it was more bottom up where it was simply asking people to do the right thing. So, uh, but the point being over half of the world's population was essentially sheltering in place 
in early April. Uh, and uh, that certainly um, had got us thinking. Uh, and then, of course, not surprisingly, we started to see a pulse in science. So that if one keeps track of the number of journal articles that come out over time on the topic of COVID, uh, you can see that there was essentially nothing before January. And all of a sudden, there's this uh, incredible spike in, pub in publications. Now, most of these early publications dealt entirely with public health and trying to understand uh, this from a um, from a viral perspective an epidemiological perspective and a health perspective however since then starting in about may and june we started to see a couple papers appearing that that were considering the environmental impact of COVID. A lot of these are thought pieces. So you can see the first one there, indirect, effect, indirect effects of COVID on the environment, and then a follow-up one there on the bottom on minimizing the present and future plastic waste, energy, and environmental footprints related to COVID. And so whether it be the travel restrictions, uh, decrease in, in global air travel, uh, the increased uh, litter and waste being generated uh, and, and so on. It sort of goes, goes on and on. But the point is people started to really think about COVID and the environment. And it was really at, at this time that I started to scratch my head and say, well, okay, you know, this is neat. I'm seeing these, these interesting papers that certainly have me thinking and being a fish head, I started thinking about fish and freshwater ecosystems. And that really is the genesis for most of what I'm going to talk about today. So I'm going to start off with providing you a, an overview of a, a synthesis we did thinking about COVID and freshwater fish uh, on a global basis. Then I'm going to move on and talk about a COVID recreational fishing survey that we conducted right here in Ontario. I'm going to then talk about a local COVID anthropause research project. If you don't know what the anthropause is, don't worry, I'll introduce you to that term in, in a few minutes. And then finally, I'm going to reflect on what COVID has done uh, to our, our research program, how we pivoted, pivoted and things that I'm thinking about as we move forward. All right, so let's start with that, that freshwater fish review. All right, so essentially we wanted to ask the question, how has COVID-19 uh, influenced or how may it influence freshwater fish biodiversity? And to do so, we played off the idea that freshwater biodiversity is already doing poorly. And that's evident in the graph below. That's from the Living Planet Index and everything's referenced back to the 1970s as if that was pristine. We know it wasn't, but, but just play, play along with me here. And you can see that marine wildlife and terrestrial wildlife is, is down significantly, but freshwater is doing much more poorly, down over 80% relative to 1970 levels. So there's tons of threats that fish face and how have those been modulated, either mitigated or amplified, by COVID. Uh, I assembled a team of 12 uh, uh, with researchers from 12 countries around the globe, uh, including all continents except Antarctica, and we tackled this question, relying heavily on news reports and local knowledge because there's so little published on this topic as of yet. And so for the next few slides, I'm going to walk you through a few examples. In the middle, there is the issue. So you can see that right above that, the common carp says invasive species. And then we've got an example of something that's positive that's come from COVID on the left, something negative on the right, and then an action at the bottom. So in the case of invasive species, we've seen reductions in species movements associated with this reduction in global trade and travel. There's a lot of um, uh, freshwater fish that are moved around in the aquarium trade. That essentially has been halted as, as just one example. And then on the downside, constraints on citizen science programs, where normally citizen science would be going out into the wild, uh, collecting data and sharing that with uh, the scientific community, essentially being uh, um, uh, extra, extra eyes, if you will. Uh, the action, how do we address this moving forward? We need to ensure control, monitoring, and, and surveillance uh, um, are, are, uh, continue, uh, and they're resilient in the case of future lockdowns. And so I'll go on to another example here, and I'm just going to touch on a few. Fragmentation, which affects the ability of, of organisms to move freely in aquatic ecosystems. In some areas, we've seen a slowing of hydropower development, but in others, we've seen a relaxation of environmental regulations in an attempt to expedite recovery, uh, economic recovery. So there, we need to really be thinking about environmental, uh, making sure our regulations uh, are not weakened, and that when we rebuild, we do so thinking carefully about the, the trade-offs particularly in the water energy food nexus. 
Next example is habitat loss. So we've seen some delayed industrial development in some regions, but we've also seen a proliferation of illegal activities that harm fish habitat under reduced environmental enforcement. So here we need to ensure that our environmental regulations are not weakened and incorporate restoration programs into economic stimulus. I would love to see uh, us not, not just build big concrete structures, but actually put money into repairing our, our, our damaged aquatic ecosystems. Uh, climate change, uh, obviously there's opportunities here to transition to greener infrastructure with reductions in greenhouse gas emissions, but we've also diverted public attention away from climate change. People are focused on, on their personal health and safety and livelihoods. They aren't thinking about climate change. So that's a bit of a challenge. So we need to avoid returning to pre-pandemic pre uh, global emission levels and ensure that this issue regains the priority that it needs post-pandemic. And then the final example I want to touch on here today, and there are many other threats that we've dug into, I'm just trying to give you an overview, is exploitation. So we, in some areas, we've seen reductions in fishing effort and harvest due to the, uh, especially during those early lockdown phases. However, when those lockdowns are prolonged, we've also seen evidence of increased effort when folks lose income, they need food, or are looking for time for recreation. And so we need to manage exploitation in light of this exceptional demand uh, with a particular focus on ensuring subsistence and livelihood needs are, are met, while at the same time making sure that we don't trade those off entirely for conservation. So trying to find that right balance. So if I were to summarize these and the other threats we looked at, um, it's really about a paradox. And in fact, this is the first paper that I was involved with where we wrote about COVID. And it was based on some work in India where we were seeing two things happen. We were seeing dramatic improvements in water quality in rivers. You could see fish uh, in, in systems that had been turbid for, for decades. Uh, you know, uh, the a lot of the indust industries were, were temporarily shut down. Uh, some rivers were literally different colors from clothing dyes and so on. And all of that disappeared almost overnight. However, that is, con uh, that is juxtap juxtaposed against uh, the elevated extinction risk to some iconic fish species. So this is the uh, humpback mazir. It is critically endangered and they have become a go-to food source for local communities looking for food in the face of COVID. So here we've got this paradox. Great, we've got cleaner rivers, but now we've got elevated extinction risk rising from different fishing practices. Uh, and some of those are destructive fishing practices, uh, felling electrical lines to, uh, uh, to stun fish or using cyanide to kill these fish. Um, so so some, certainly some challenges there. I do wanna point out one other thing on this paper. Look in the top left corner and I've circled it there. We submitted that paper on June 1st and it was accepted on June 2nd. To say that the level of science that's coming out today is being given the same rigor of peer review as, as one would uh, hope for, it's, it's, it's just not the case. I'm not suggesting this is a crappy paper, but this is something that as a scientific community, we certainly need to be thinking about. There's a lot of science being rushed to publication and that we need to make sure that we're generating high quality evidence. All right. Uh, if we look at the different activities that uh, oftentimes we do when we think about freshwater fisheries management and conservation, we enforce policy and we know that a lot of that enforcement has been curtailed because of safety concerns. We create regulations and enforce them in the same thing. We're seeing decreases in that kind of activity. We spend time trying to restore habitats and we know that restoration activities are delivered largely by volunteers and those have been halted due to safety concerns. We do research and we know that fisheries research, especially work that occurs across political boundaries has been canceled or postponed. And then of course, monitoring and stock assessment, which is really the foundation for fisheries conservation and management has been halted. We've seen interruptions in long-term data uh, sets. Uh, the last interruption, if any, was back during the Second World War. Uh, and this is really impeding science-based management. So this is just sort of a general overview of the kinds of things that I'm worried about uh, when I think about, about fish. All right, so that was very high level. That was very, very global. So let's try and zoom in on something a bit more uh, a bit more specific and get into that in a bit more depth. So let's talk about this recreational fishing survey that we've done in Ontario. And so 
There's no doubt that some jurisdictions instituted fishing regulations. I worked with scientists in Quebec provincial government uh, where we assembled a list of all the different uh, regulations, regula uh, regulations and other practices that were instituted during the early phases of the pandemic. And during those first two months of the 63 jurisdictions in North America where we could find information, 92% of them continued to allow recreational fishing. However, there were closure of parks, boat ramps, closure of um, fishing stores, cancellation of fishing tournaments and so on. So even though in many jurisdictions it was legal to fish, there were other restrictions that prevented that from happening. If you can't get on the water or access uh, um, uh, the shore, then you can't fish. And so those were certainly some real challenges faced uh, around the world. And the same thing played out right here in Ontario. Below, uh, at the bottom of the, the image there, you can see some closure signs from boat ramps across Ontario. And we started out with that first state of emergency declared on March 17th. And then it was around May 16th, roughly two months later, where we started to see things relax a little bit and, and open up. And we were in, majority of Ontario was in the second stage of recovery around July 15th. So today, in, for this aspect of the talk, I'm going to talk about two phases. That early phase of two months, which was the lockdown, and that second phase where we were all still being careful, but you know the people were interested in getting out in the water and figuring out what they could do safely. And so we conducted an online survey. We had zero dollars to do this, so we couldn't do a mail survey. Uh, so we uh, used a, a snowball sampling approach, and it has a number of limitations that I, I don't have time to get in here today. Uh, Ontario Out of Doors was great. They wrote a news article on this, created that nice little image there with the Carlton uh, logo on the screen. Uh, and this is a project that's being led by Andrew Howarth and a number of other folks from Carleton, the University of Ottawa, and UMass Amherst. And we're just in the processes of finalizing these data. So you're the first to see them. So one of the questions we asked was about fishing effort. And that's between 2019 and 2020. So we asked people to think back about how much they fished between March 17th and May 16th in 2019, prior to the pandemic, and then the same period in 2020. And you can see there's a, a very small reduction, roughly a, you know, a, a day and a half reduction during that two month period, during the early phase, and then during that later phase, again, you know, roughly two days less. But in the big scheme of things, you know, this is largely similar. There's a lot of variance in the numbers we got from the anglers, but not a big difference. I do want to throw in two caveats. First of all, these numbers here exclude new anglers or those that had not fished in the last five years. We had a whole bunch of folks that responded and simply had blanks for 2019 because they'd never fished before. And so I think that's really exciting. And I'll talk about that more in a minute. The other thing we did is excluded non-residents, uh, and, and that includes Americans. We know there's a ton of Americans that travel up to, and from elsewhere, that travel to fish in Canada. If we look at license sales, uh, and these are reports that CBC amassed from across Canada, you can see that across the board, we've got increases that range from as high as 30% in Alberta and Manitoba to as low as 8% in Quebec. In Ontario, we're somewhere around 20%. And again, that's consistent with our findings. Many of the people that we surveyed said that they've started fishing uh, or resumed fishing because they had more time on their hands and they felt like fishing outdoors was a safe way uh, a safe place to be and a way to um, uh, help maintain their, their health and wellness. Some of the other findings, and again, I'm, I'm taking a whole study and, and basically condensing it down to just a few slides here. We found no change in fish capture, the number of fish that people were actually capturing. So the fishing didn't seem to get any better per se. Uh, there was a 30% decrease in fish harvested. And that surprises me, to be honest. And again, uh, I, I would have assumed that people were keeping more fish uh, if people were hurting from the, the, fi uh, the financial consequences of COVID. Uh, this is a, a safe and relatively inexpensive way to obtain a, a good clean source of protein. We did see an increase in money spent on rec fishing, but it was mostly in the form of online purchases from big box stores and from uh, the United States. So local tackle shops, mom and dad shops, local bait businesses were not benefiting. It was the, uh, the big, big industry that was benefiting there. 
Uh, the folks in our survey also reported a, an approximately 60 or 60 percent of anglers decreased fishing related travel. So people were fishing, but they were doing it closer to home, which isn't surprising. We also asked about the quality of communication with anglers. Uh, about 16 percent said that the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry did a poor job. And then about 22 percent said municipal governments did a poor job. Now, I'm highlighting, you know, the sort of the negative here. But the other way to flip this is say, you know, by and large, the bulk of people actually thought the communication was pretty good. Uh, some of the concerns we did see were mixed messaging leading to confusion about restrictions. And sometimes the rationale behind closures wasn't provided. Uh, clearly, moving forward, there's need for more clarity about the uh, and also need for MNR and the municipalities to work more closely together. So there's again that consistency in messaging. Wherever it comes from, the messaging needs to be clear, uh, it needs to be frequent and updated in a timely manner. I just want to give a shout out to the Ontario Federation of Anglers and Hunters because they were repeatedly recognized by survey participants as providing clear uh, and consistent information and serving as a communication hub. And here's uh, what I mean by that. They created two um, uh, uh, components to their website. The first being a list where one could go to look at all the restrictions and closures that were occurring that affected fishing and hunting in Ontario. So if one wanted to go fishing somewhere, you could go there and get a good feeling for what was open and what was closed. The other thing they did was create advice to anglers and hunters on how to engage during the pandemic. And that was something that it would have been nice to see government produce, OFAH stepped up and did it and shared it widely. So kudos to them. We also asked the, uh, the participants as we prepared, uh, we were at the time asking them about preparing for a future in a second wave. I think it's fair to say that we're there now. Uh, respondents said they'd like to see the Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry increase enforcement, monitoring and stocking, strengthen harvest restrictions under the assumption that I think people thought people were harvesting more, and educated anglers, especially the new ones, relicenses, regulations and best practices. The majority of, of the folks wanted the government to keep the U.S. borders closed. They wanted boat launches and ramps open and limit access at high risk locations and favor local use as opposed to folks that are driving in from afar. Uh, but at the end of the day, many of these comments mentioned the benefits of fishing to their health, outdoor experiences and food security. And I think that's one of the important things to take away and share with government is that most people thought this was a safe activity and were thankful that they were able to engage in it when uh, when boat ramps and, and such opened up. All right. I'm going to move on to uh, a local example of some COVID anthropos research. So I've, you may have heard the word the Anthropocene, and that's sort of the, the period that we're in now. It's a period that's dominated by humans. We are a major force on this earth. And if you look off to the left there, there's a, a, a figure that's snatched from a science magazine. And basically all of those upward trending lines are things like, I've got up in that corner there, the number of large dams, water use, urban population, fertilizer use, and so on. And we've seen what's called the Great Acceleration since 1950 through to today, where all of these things have gotten worse. These are all sorts of environmental indicators. And so the anthropause is the idea that all of these things or many of these things have been put on pause. And this creates a unique opportunity to understand the effects of that pause in human activity on biodiversity and the environment. So when four billion of us were sheltered in place, what did wildlife do when we weren't out there uh, gallivanting across the countryside? So Dave Phillip and Julie Clausen are with the University of Illinois and the Fisheries Conservation Foundation. They're pictured on either side of me in my kitchen in that photo. Dave happened to be my PhD advisor. Julie and Dave are partners and Julie is uh, also a, a research scientist. And they've been doing a lot of work at Queen's University Biological Station for decades on bass reproduction, bass spawning. And so they were stuck in the US uh, they were unable to get up here, but several team members were from, uh, from my lab were able to get out and help them uh, execute this brilliant study. And basically what we did was ask whether the anthropos benefited bass reproductive success relative to 2019. So we already had data from 2019. How did things shake out in 2020? Here's the data. 
So we have these data for both largemouth bass, so LMB and smallmouth bass, SMB. And you can see in both cases for both species, in 2019, uh, the percent of successful nests, 17% for largemouth, 29 for smallmouth. And then in 2020, this year during the pandemic, it jumped way up, 76%, 77%. So way higher uh, levels of, of nesting success. What does that translate to in terms of, uh, of actual fry production? So let's just look at that, that middle column on fry production. You can see there, even though there were fewer uh, nests overall in 2020, they were highly successful and produced a whole bunch of fry. 60% of the eggs made it to fry uh, in 2020 for uh, largemouth and 62 for smallmouth. Now what's driving this? Um, I told you that the local anglers weren't weren't out there necessarily in droves. But what we did see was a dramatic reduction in American tourists. And not to point the finger at Americans, and it's not solely Americans, but a lot of Americans come up to fish for pike and sunfish early in the season when bass are guarding their nets. When we snorkel, we can see bruises on the, the mouth area of bass that have been caught. We call those hook wounds when we're snorkeling. And you can see here that hook wounds were down dramatically this year relative to uh, 2019. And we think that's the driver for the increase in reproductive success that we observe. So a fascinating example of where the anthropos showed us the effects that we have as humans. And that might create opportunities for us moving forward. The last thing I want to do today is touch on reflections on our own research in 2020. So obviously there were cancellations, field work we had planned across Canada, work in Florida, Denmark, and so on, obviously came to a halt. Several students had to pivot their projects. Uh, in particular, one of the students, uh, Carrie, was supposed to be out studying sturgeon spawning habitat in a number of rivers across Ontario. She'd already been affected by the floods the previous year. So, so basically, uh, she was two years with no data. So thankfully, the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry stepped up and gave us access to a fantastic sturgeon telemetry data set that she's working with. So I just want to flag the cooperation that we're seeing among teams. And then uh, when we got approval, we had three teams of three working together as their own little bubbles. And since then, we've had six more students approved. Our real focus during this time was not on research. It was on self-care and team care. I don't want to, uh, by any means, underemphasize the, the challenges that, that students and early career researchers are facing. I know it's difficult for all of us, but you know they're very invested. Many of them have, have come to join research teams traveling from across Canada or the world to learn about fish and aquatic ecosystems. And uh, you know they've, they've been stuck at home in their one bedroom apartments or in a, uh, a house with 10 roommates. Uh, it is incredibly stressful. I was fortunate, uh, and, and so when we did get back into the field, this is what it looked like. We had our, our lab buffs. Uh, that's Jordana with a muskie that she tagged just last week. So we're continuing to uh, socially distance and, and wear masks in the field. Uh, but in my case, I was bubbled with my kids and I couldn't be part of any of these field bubbles. So uh, as you can see here, uh, we were interviewed on quirks and quarks. And you can see the, the title here, a fisheries biologist copes with the shutdown by drafting his kids as research assistants. And that's what we did. And uh, I have three boys all under the age of 10 and they've been very kind to me. I've, I bribed them this morning. So they have not, not uh, busted into this door. They're learning just behind me. Uh, so thanks to them. But I'm gonna just share a, a video to show you how I engage them in the research. So here's a little video with some sound.
So with my crack team of three boys, we were able to uh, to tag over a thousand fish. Uh, we conducted several experiments generating data that were handed over to undergrad. So we tried to make the best of a, uh, a challenging situation. I will add that they also uh, didn't just get to do the fun parts of field work. Uh, the, the two older kids uh, helped with data entry uh, and you can see that's what they're doing there. So an opportunity them for them to flex their brains. All right, so this is my last slide. So this is sort of the, the outlook. And I think if you reflect on everything I shared today, it's really a mixed bag for freshwater fish during COVID times. I'm thankful that, that I live where I do, where I've got access to plentiful freshwater and rich freshwater fisheries resources that I've been able to use to try and uh, uh, maintain my mental health during this period. Uh, you can, you, and I shared with you examples of where some things have gotten better, you know, less pollution in some areas, yet we might be seeing more exploitation. So these are things that management agencies certainly need to be thinking about. But there's two things I want to leave you with that I think are, are of concern. The first is the next generation of environmental problem solvers. These are the, again, that, you know, the students, undergrads, college students, undergrads, grad students, um, and school looks a little bit different from them. Uh, they aren't getting those hands-on experiences uh, that many of us were fortunate to have. And what hooked us on science and on ecology and on fresh waters. And so that certainly is concern for me. The second is that as much as I like biology, conservation is not about biology. It's about people and partnerships. And those valuable, valuable interactions have halted or at least been dramatically uh, uh, um, uh, impacted. And I know there's still a few, um, you know, glimmers of hope. I know that Matt Windle was able to get out with uh, local uh, Indigenous fisheries technicians to sample um, and in continue to engage in their partnerships. But those examples are few and far between. And I think this is something we really, really need to keep our eye on uh, and make sure that we find mechanisms to continue to engage people uh, in science, in environmental issues, and develop the partnerships we need to to ensure that we have healthy and productive aquatic ecosystems. And with that, I really appreciate your attention. I hope everybody is doing well, and I look forward to taking any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Steve, for that um, amazing talk. And you've just synthesized so many different aspects of how COVID is impacting freshwater fisheries. It's just an interesting thought experiments and also the way that you um, applied some some very direct research on those results is is really interesting and I just love watching that video of the uh, your your son's help out with the uh, the fish tagging the technique was, actually looked that smooth to be clear it was not always that smooth <laughs> yeah <laughs> the uh, their technique was really good though that was that was amazing so uh, we actually have a couple questions from uh, the public here on whether or not uh, Jordan asks whether they'll be um, included as authors on your next paper, if that's uh, if that data is published. Uh, so there is one paper we're working on that the three kids will likely be on. Uh, so I've got uh, um, one postdoc who's supporting that project and and doing the analysis, and then we're going to, my, as I said, my kids are are learning virtually, and we're always looking for interesting ways to engage them. And uh, they're obviously not going to write any of the text, but we can talk about how to frame a discussion and talk about, uh, you know, visualize the findings and talk about them together. Uh, I'll add that my 10 year old, when he was six, already helped with some science and he's already a published author. That's amazing. That's great. And that kind of touches on something that you, you mentioned too, on, on the impact of COVID too. All this generation of, of uh, students coming up now that, that are not getting the same experience in the field and, and interacting with uh, nature, maybe getting inspired to, to pursue some of these careers. And I mean, your kids, I think, are going to be fine. But uh, I, you know, what what do you think the outlook is uh, moving forward if if you know twenty twenty one looks like this and maybe twenty two twenty two and yeah, uh, and we were reflecting this on this as a unit at Carleton the other day trying to figure out whether or not it makes sense to think about resuming our field courses next fall or whether we already need to be planning for putting things online. Some of our field courses we simply delayed. And so we've got students that need skill, certain skills and need certain credits to graduate. And we've said, well, we'll, we'll just do it next year with a double cohort. Um, and that, that just isn't gonna work uh, necessarily if this continues. So uh, 
uh, I think we're probably going to invest in in uh, developing lots of uh, uh, video content. Um, there's challenges uh, with having students that are spread across Canada and the world uh, go out in their own backyards and do these kinds of things on their own. We could create some amazing labs. The problem is if we've got a student that's joining us from uh, from uh, say Tokyo uh, and they go out into the you know <laughs> uh, an urban area on their own at night and you know and and run into some unsavory characters, uh, there's dangerous wildlife out there. Not everybody can swim, so there's a lot of liability issues. So things that might appear simple, like oh well, just have them you know go do a, a, an assessment on their local stream, come with huge liability issues. So lots of challenges. Yeah. There's another question here uh, from Anonymous. Um, great stuff. Is there broad empirical evidence across journals or fields that COVID has led to expedited peer review and potentially shoddy work being published? You kind of oh. touched that a bit with your one day turnover on your. Uh... Yeah, um, so admittedly that was a commentary, so uh, it, you know, um, um, so I'm not as concerned about that piece. Um, but uh, I, I really worry about it um, in the medical realm, and there are folks that have already documented uh, a, a whole bunch of crappy science that's being generated. Even under good circumstances, a lot of the science that's generated isn't that great. And Jessica Taylor will be talking about that in her evidence synthesis talk. Um, we've got a paper that we submitted recently. Hopefully it gets a rigorous peer review. And it's all about that. It's the importance of uh, learning from the healthcare realm and making sure that if that um, uh, as scientists if we're going to do covid research that we ensure that it, it it's done at, a, at um a high standards so that it's not misused or misinterpreted or uh, or that it it simply fails to um you know that the findings and and conclusions don't don't jive with crappy methods and and so on and that's the challenge with all of this it's opportunistic right um we didn't design a before after control impact study even that vast study that i presented we've got before data and then we've got covid data we don't have another area where there was not fishing before or not after. So, so there's some, you know, it, it's still even even that data, and I'm pretty proud of what we found there. It's still imperfect. That's that's yeah. I have so many questions as well on that uh, that vast study, which is really interesting. But I'll get it to a few more. We have time for uh, maybe two more questions um, from the public. So Liz in Lakefield says, "I'm so glad the talks are recorded. As a high school teacher, I need to show this to my." Biology, environmental science, and environmental students. And I'd love to have these guest speakers sometime. Are there any mechanisms beginning uh, to form uh, regarding being able to continue the gains from the pandemic lockdown and avoid the losses? Great question. Uh, so the, you've got my email there. Don't don't hesitate to drop me a line. And if I'm unavailable, I've got a, a fantastic lab full of uh, students and postdocs and, and other colleagues that would uh, be willing to, to speak with you or any other educators that are out there. Um, yeah, you know, that, that's a tough one. Um, I think that some of, we're, we're in a transition and there's a lot of work being done in transitions. Uh, I represented Canada on uh, the G20 has the S20. So those are the G20 countries and they get together and focus on science issues. And over the past six months, we've been working on transitions and thinking about how uh, we can do a better job of, be, of um, thinking about what's coming at us, being prepared and taking advantage uh, of these situations to pivot, not just to benefit the environment, but to benefit humanity broadly. Um, and so it's something that that's certainly being thought about by governments, by scholars uh, around the globe. And so all I can say is I'm, I'm hopeful for that, but we'll really have to see. It's gonna come down to how stimulus money is spent. Right now it's been focused on supporting people, which makes great sense, but eventually it's going to be focused on, on related things um, such as supporting infrastructure, um, building and development and programs. And we need to make sure those programs align with the uh, with uh, with an environmental ideals that I think we all embrace as Canadians. That's that's great. Um... I have another question that kind of touches on that, but there's another one here. You have lots of questions. Uh, where do you see our freshwater lakes uh, in the future? Do you think COVID has piqued people's interest in conservation? That's from Almira. Yeah. Uh, I think for some people it has. Um, I, I'm 
there's a lot more people out on trails in nature i'm not sure the extent to which they're interacting with fresh water though that's my concern yes we've got you know some more anglers out there that's positive but when most people go for walks, if they walk by a wetland, they sort of, you know, turn their nose up at it and say, oh, a swamp. So, yes, we're getting lots more people out into parks, but I, I'm just not sure they're making those connections with aquatic ecosystems. So I think there's that's a challenge for us, something we, we have to continue to do. Uh, but if we can do that, you know, again, conservation is about people. It's about how people vote. It's about how people consume. It's about how people interact with the environment. And those are the kinds of things that I'm hoping aquatic ecosystems will benefit from more generally as people connect with nature, even if it's not aquatic ecosystems. Well said. Um, so we'll, uh, that kind of brings us to the close of our question period here. And uh, Steve has put up his um, email address on the screen there. So I invite you if you have uh, more questions um, to contact uh, Dr. Steve Cook and I'm sure he or other members of his lab can provide you some more information. Uh, so thank you so much Steve for that uh, presentation and all, all the work that you do. I really appreciate it.